it's not easy to do something like this and much less for somebody like you to state yourself and you know because at a time when there's so much misinformation you don't want somebody else who's spewing misinformation right it is a risk that you're taking there's so much to talk about but really go in any direction so there's one way to look at the future man that's cool so this is today, Feb 3rd, February 4th, 5th, 6th, it, Weave me a tapestry of what the counter theory to the Big Bang Theory is. The biggest counter theory is the universe is eternal. And then I thought, what if it's, no, what if it is a constant? And what if the universe doesn't have an age? One of the main determining factors about to see who's right or not would be to falsify or verify whether there is an even scattering of young and old galaxies as distance goes, you know? Like, it seems like if, if there is one, the Big Bang Theory is just completely falsified. I'm a lot more convinced than I was at the beginning of this conversation. And it sounds like there's, I mean, especially if that equation is right, I mean, that's wild. That's, that's insane. It's world changing. All right, let's go. So welcome guys, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and everything in between uh, to the Epiphany podcast. This, I am being joined by uh, Mr. Gupta. Uh, he is, I'm going to let him, I'm going to let him describe himself. Actually, he seems to be an expert on cosmology. And we're here to discuss perhaps one of the most important and widely discussed topics, not just in human civilization, but probably throughout trillions and trillions of civilizations across our universe. And that is, where did we come from? The origins of our universe and what the fuck happened right at the beginning, or is there even a beginning? And I'd just like to preface before you introduce yourself that I'm, I come at this as, as, as a skeptic, you know, obviously I've been trained to believe that the Big Bang exists, but also as somebody who I, I'd like to believe I'm humble enough to know that I don't know what I don't know. And when somebody reached out to me and said, hey, I've got this, this guy and this, these groups of people that are questioning something so big and intense, I was like, I, I would love to speak about this because I am very well aware that scientific consensus doesn't mean it doesn't mean nothing, but it doesn't mean what people tend to believe it means, which is pretty much as taking it as gospel fact. And if there's even a one in 10,000 chance that what you're saying is true, I want to be part of it, man. What a fucking adventure. So uh, please, please do introduce yourself and uh, what you do and the, the kind of theory that you have that goes against the Big Bang Theory. Uh, so thanks so much, Charlie, uh, for having me on. And uh, it's... Um, you know, it's, it's really, in, uh, it's not easy to do something like this and much less for somebody like you to state yourself and, you know, and, and because at a time when there's so much misinformation, you don't want somebody else who's spewing misinformation, right? So it's, it, I really appreciate, you know, the, you know, it is a risk that you're taking and I thank you, you know, for taking that risk. Uh, but I just basically need to set the stage that I'm coming at this through logic and even though it's challenging status quo cosmology. It's really only coming at this through logic. Um, so uh, I'm Sahil. Uh, I run a 3D software company uh, based in Silicon Valley called space.io and we turn photos into models. And uh, we, and, and maybe we can talk about you know, that later, but the only reason I wanna bring it up is that being involved in 3D modeling is how these ideas occurred to me. Spending a lot of time in Blender, spending a lot of time working with 3D artists who just naturally understand XYZ space and visualize objects in their mind and then model them. You know, a little bit of that rubbed off on me. So I, I now started, in, you know, thinking about um, planets, uh, solar system, uh, star systems, not as notation, not as, uh, not as, you know, plastic models of, you know, you know, these, you know, toy models, but actually as points in blender space. And it was really helpful to get the spatial intuition, you know, go, going naturally. And, um, and what got me into this was, well, I, I always had a lifelong interest in cosmology. I mean, as I think most people do, I mean, you're trying to figure out what's going on and, and you see these photos of these gigantic nebulae and these, uh, giant, you know, pillars of gas. And it's like, and nobody imagined this stuff, right? Even the most intelligent people a hundred years ago didn't imagine it. We had to observe it. Um, and we had to have the telescopes to observe it. So I think this is something that, you know, I like talking about from the perspective of people at different time periods, because then you realize what knowledge they couldn't have even had because they, they couldn't even see it. 
Like people, the smartest people hundred years ago couldn't even, they didn't even know what's on your, you know, on your hoodie. They, they couldn't even, it didn't register. They, they didn't see fine fashion right when it was right in front of it. <laughs> you had a fashion too. And um, like, no matter how big your imagination is, they couldn't have imagined that. You know, that's a fact. Uh, and, and I like that it's a fact. Um, so the, uh, there's so much to talk about, but really, um, I, I just want to answer questions that you have and, I've got, I've got and, and go in any direction. Uh, and, um, and maybe I'll say one thing. I just want to say a bunch of words to like set the scale of what's going on. So, uh, the smallest things to the biggest things, it's just so like there's a language for the smallest things to the biggest things. Um, so, uh, you can start with a photon or a discrete wave of light. Uh, then you can go to an electron, then you can go to a proton, then you can go to an atom, then a molecule, then uh, what else did I, uh, a raindrop, you know, it's like something that's like, you can see it, but it's also bigger in scale. So like a raindrop, then a human hand, uh, like, you know, a human hand is made of protons too. So it's actually helpful to just connect that. So you can think about your hand as a bunch of protons sometimes uh, to the earth, to the sun, to a star system, to a galaxy, to a galaxy cluster. A galaxy cluster is a bunch of galaxies, and a galaxy is a bunch of stars swirling. Uh, galaxy cluster, then a galaxy filament, and then all of that's universe. What's a, what's a filament? Filaments, when you have a bunch of galaxy clusters like lined up, and- um, Cluster squares, yeah. got it, okay. Yeah, it looks like a spider web, kind of. Actually, it looks like a spider web. And then galaxy filaments, super large, like the largest macro thing that we see. And then all of this is universe. Beautiful. Okay. That's, and, uh, uh, that's oh, and that's why I sent the, uh, the Star Wars footage. It's like, <laughs> I, I have so much respect for 3D artists because what they, you know, when the Star Wars artists make those landscapes and those scenescapes, they do it consulting like the best astrophysicists and cosmologists and try to get the feeling of, of, uh, of that right. Now, I don't necessarily think warp drive is possible, but, uh, you know, everything else could be. Uh, yeah, so just, just, to, just to say something on that first, I'm 100% in agreement with what I think you were getting at, which is when we look back in history, obviously, everyone, at, at every point in history, people thought that this was modernity, that we know pretty much everything that there is to know. And, uh, you know, we... Any, anything that goes against our current knowledge is, is either heresy or anti-scientific or whatever that is. And now if we were to take, say, a thousand years step forward or even a hundred years step forward because of the exponential evolution of technology, we're going to look back at how we are now and just be like, I can't believe that they were wrong about this or this or that or that. And it's uh, we have to be humble. We have to be humble in our approach to everything. We could have uh, a complete model about something or an ostensibly complete model about something. But it turns out just because of this one variable, it's an incomplete data set, which completely shifts everything on its heads uh, about what we think about something, especially when it's so ethereal as uh, something like the origins of the universe. Um, so let, let's let's explore the counter theory. Give me a give me a picture, paint me a, 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 a weave me a tapestry of what the counter theory to the Big Bang theory is. Uh, the biggest counter theory is the concept of the counter theory is that it's the universe is eternal. So no beginning, no ending, just an eternal present that's evolving. And that 13.8 billion years, which is a real physical constant, it, it comes from measurements of redshift, that it's a constant and not necessarily an age. So it's a constant just like big G or K Coulomb's constant, or H small h Planck's constant. And what got the scientific establishment to interpret 13.8 billion years as an age, well, that was a mistake. And in its place, it's a constant that describes the redshift, the universe is forever. And well, there are certain things that have an age, like the earth formed about 4 billion years ago. Uh, the formation of the sun, that also had a somewhat of a start date, uh, even, probably, even probably the Milky Way had a start date-ish, as in all the gas coalescing. But beyond galaxies and maybe galaxy clusters, then you're into like amorphous gas. And that's where I think 
it's easier to see that there's no there's no beginning to universe. And in its place, the universe is forever. You know, galaxies are forming and winding out their life cycles. And and um, and I can probably talk through the journey, but if you want to like poke in any specific area, I'd, I'd be happy to dive down that. Yeah. Okay. So I think firstly, I would like to say that this is always going to be a very difficult conversation for people to comprehend every single human being because we're so used to experiencing the world as something where time is linear you know you wake up at, at 6 a.m or you know if you're a poker player you wake up at 11 a.m if you're lucky and then you you end up having breakfast at a certain time you go to work at a certain time you go to sleep everything that we experience is is based on a linear time whereas from a from a modern scientific perspective and a cosmological perspective, it's often cited that time isn't actually a linearity, it's a singularity, meaning that the, the past, the present and the future are all kind of intertwined into one, and, but we only experience it as a linearity. Um, so this conversation is always, for me at least, going to be very confusing, and I think for everybody, uh, because time is such a mindfuck, uh, especially when you're a human. Uh, so do you, do you want to kind of maybe comment on whether you think everything I just time? said is true. Yeah, let's, let's talk about time and linearity and, cir and circularity. Um, so can we take the perspective of, say, people 10,000 years ago, and we can reason our way into the present. <laughs> so 10,000 years ago, uh, there were no clocks, there were no watches, there were no, uh, I don't even know if they had like pendulums or something, you know, grandfather clocks, or you know, they didn't have that. So time was basically counting, it's just counting. And it's up to your tribe when you want to start counting. It's like, hey, okay, we're going to you know, say today is the day we start counting, and then we're going to start counting after that. And that's basically what it is. That's what GMT is. That's what UTC is. That's what Unix time is. Um, so if 10,000 years ago, <clears throat> what would you try and coordinate people around? As a question to you, what would you try and coordinate people around? How would you define time? The, the sun, mainly. Sun, yeah. So... <clears throat> one year is one loop around the sun such that you see the same stars in the sky ish. I mean, roughly, uh, of course, those stars are moving a little bit, but it's basically stable. And then, uh, and also the seasons change. So it's like, you can reach agreement around that. So that's what a year is. And then a year was chopped up into, uh, days, 365.25, 365. Uh, and then that was chopped up into 24 hours into 60 minutes, 60 seconds. So all of that, the, the definition of the second came from the, came from the year and the day. So that's what, I think that's the most like solid foundation of understanding of time. It's just counting about things that come back, you know, that, that come full circle. <laughs> And it keeps happening. So you just count your ticks by that, you know, like tick, 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 tick. That's basically what it is. And that same principle is why we have watches that are circular. So there's no, um, there's no, there's nobody in, uh, there's nobody in some like, there's nothing outside the universe keeping time. I mean, there's nothing outside the universe. Yeah, there's so no, there's no magic, magic wizard just sitting there creating yeah. time motions and spreading it out or anything like that. Yeah, he's not, yeah. <laughs> It's just something that's ticking and then we count that. And then we've just made that smaller. So we made the sundial smaller into a, uh, a, a ticking, um, uh, I don't know what, the, what they use next. Did they use like a steam engine to like spin something? I don't know. But then whoever's basically the most, you know, whoever's in charge sets that as the time standard. And then, oh, and then, you know, trains and, you know, coordinating train times. Uh, so then there's an, you know, there's a societal pressure to keep a standard time and then it gets smaller, you know, make, you, you make pocket watches, you make quartz watches, you make atomic clocks. And what is an atomic clock? Uh, it's an atom of cesium or maybe a bunch of atoms of cesium and you fire, uh, uh, photons at it and then they bounce back and then you do that until you get resonance. Huh. So it's like, um, you get resonance with the cesium atom. And then you count those ticks. And then some number of those ticks was equated to a second. And then we basically let go of the, the year, the year day second, and then define the second in terms of the ticking cesium atom. Huh. Fascinating. So yeah, time is really about what, what counting and what you want to count.
Yeah, so I would say this is more of an explanation of time being relative and almost like a non-physical quantity, or it may, maybe even to be for it to be a physical quantity, but a, a non a non constant quantity or something like that. Um, I would say that 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 is slightly different to to experiencing time linearly and uh, versus uh, singularly. Yeah, there are helpful you know, reasons to see time linearly, and it certainly helps. Like. Uh, I mean, we know we're going to live about 100 years in most of us, and it's, it's you know, it's helpful to see that as, as, as a linear thing. And um, uh, if I could share one thing that I made, uh, which please is actually in regards to that, um, I was thinking about the calendar and how the current calendar is like a grid of seven days a week, you know, four or five weeks a month. And but that's not how like time is like, why are we coordinating our lives in this grid that's like, you know, time is not rectangular. <laughs> so I thought about what if, what if I can like make it, um, what if we could see time spatially and instead of time going left to right, top to bottom, it's going straight. It's going straight into the screen. Oh, that's so cool. I'm, so you have yeah, a 3D, 3D calendar? A 3D calendar. And it was a prototype. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. I feel like I'm looking, the looking into the future. I'll, I'll just make it so you can one second. Yeah, you can now. I might need 30 seconds to get this going. Take time. <clears throat> See what the chat's in. Somebody says you have a super soothing voice. Little Indy in the chat. This is the question I was planning on asking. Is that coming up? <clears throat> I can see it. All right. Well, this reminds me of watching 3D chess yeah. or 5, 5D chess as well. <laughs> So there's one way to look at the future. Man, that's cool. I love so it. Let's move around a bit. So this is today, Feb 3rd, February 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th. <laughs> Isn't that something, right? So there's tomorrow, there's the day after tomorrow, and there's the day after the day after tomorrow. So you're literally looking forward to the future. I love that. I think as, as just to, even if its functionality is uh, is the same as a normal calendar, the, the, just artistically and aesthetically, I really appreciate that. It's gorgeous. And uh, so there's like you know there's maybe a year out, two years out, and then past. Give you uh, also give you some perspective on what a day is. Yeah. So going back to today, and I can also change that back to a grid view. So there's a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and onward. That's beautiful. When did you start making this? When did I make this? Um, after, uh, after a stint I had at uh, Tesla. And I wanted to get involved in 3D software. So I thought, what could I do that's cool and could be useful? And uh, so I made this. And it's a prototype, but uh, I might return to it at some point. And it was made in uh, 3JS and A-Frame, which are really good frameworks for 3D on the web. I love it. I'll, uh, I'll ask my audience whether they'd use it and then I'll try and invest in it if you let me, if they say yeah. <laughs> All right, so let, let's, let's, go to the, let's go to your theory. What's it called? Paint me a, paint me a picture, weave me a, a tapestry and, uh, try and try and sell it to us. Sure. So the problem started with trying to understand the redshift. And the redshift is light that's redder and it's light from other galaxies. So we look at other galaxies and the light's a bit redder. We call that the redshift. And people a hundred years ago, like Edwin Hubble, were trying to understand why it was what, what, what was happening. So the scientific establishment at the time thought it was the Doppler effect. They thought all the galaxies were flying away from us. Yeah. 
just, just to explain correct, that man. to people, I'll, I'll give it a go. Uh, it's it's similar to if you hear a, an ambulance drive past you on the street. You know, it 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 makes a noise, and, nah, 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 nah. as soon as it goes past you, it goes, nah, nah, you know, it gets uh, it, it it changes frequency because when it's moving away, the the uh, it takes longer, I guess, or the acceleration is 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 there, so the the sound waves are kind of longer when they reach you. Um, and I think that if I'm understanding this correctly, that it's a similar phenomenon that uh, people were, the scientific establishment were, were suggesting that because the, uh, the galaxies were moving away from us, then the, the light that we were getting was kind of like longer wavelengths and that would be a, a red color. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what they thought. And it was, you know, a reasonable first guess. Uh, and I would have probably guessed that too. But I would have immediately corrected it, <laughs> but they didn't do that. <laughs> uh, so uh, what, what are the consequences of that? You know, if you think that everything is flying away from us, that would make it seem like we're like the center of the universe. And, and that doesn't fit with like complete impartiality. So that's one that's like a kind of an issue, which they noticed. Okay. Um, but then they thought, I have, oh, maybe I have a question on that. Do you want that after you speak or do you want it now? I'll go, yeah, go for it now. Okay. So I guess the counter argument to that, as far as I'm aware, would be imagine if you you have a balloon and you blow it up, which I'm sure you've seen yeah. people explain it like this. Um, yeah. If you are at any point on the balloon and you blow up the whole balloon, all of the points are getting further away from each other. That is, uh, that's one, yeah, that's a good idea considering that. So um, that's good to keep in mind too. Uh, so that's how they would explain it. So it's like, if you're in that galaxy, from that galaxy, it would also look like things are moving away from you. So that's how they explain that. Uh, however, uh, quickly after Edwin Hubble's discovery, they ran into a problem, which is that some galaxies seem to be flying away faster than the speed of light. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> which is... That's yeah. a pretty. That's a pretty big problem. That's a pretty big problem. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as you can imagine, scientists are people. They want to keep their jobs. So they, uh, they, you know, there was a lot of discussion. They're like, "Oh, what's going on?" It's like, "Oh, maybe uh, something else is happening, or maybe faster than life possible is okay, or something." Or, and we can make up a new rule, or uh, <laughs> and ignore a previous one, um, or maybe uh, we say something else is happening. Maybe we say space is expanding, and then we just make something up and uh and and not worry about it being self-consistent with the rest of what we're saying a and they did that and somehow this concept of space expanding is now accepted as something extraordinarily sophisticated and wise when it's just a big kludge it's like the epicycles of the geocentric model where they thought uh, all the planets were going around the earth and then they'd have to take an extra loop because if you take it from the perspective of the earth and not the sun they'll take that extra loop as they come around um, and that was, you know, there's an interesting story of the transformation of the geocentric model into the heliocentric model. Uh, and, and some people at a time were trying to make a compromise that, oh, what if actually all the, other, what if all the planets except the earth are going around the sun, but that entourage of the sun and the other planets is going around the earth <laughs> and they call it the geo the geo heliocentric model. <laughs> it, was like, it, it was a good time back then because you, you could, uh, you could basically invent anything and say it was God's divine will. And be like, yeah, and no accountability. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, but now we are sending spaceships, you know, to Mars and uh, probes beyond the solar system. Uh, you know, if, if I'm on that spaceship, I want the mathematics to work, you know. So uh, it's important now. And, um, and it's also important now because the, uh, this is the whole thing, you know. The, why I'm talking about the big circus is I found a coincidence that relates all the fundamental constants. So now everything's related. I believe, so I'll get to that. I believe that's the first time you've dropped the words big circus. So you might want to explain that that's the, the, the name of your theory. Yeah. Uh, so the big circus model is the model uh, that I'm proposing to the universe that uh, is based on three core ideas. So no galactic recession. The galaxies are not flying away. Uh, instead, the light is redshifted by, by the light undergoing continuous decay as it's moving. And a cool word for this might be photon hubbling mm. or light hubbling what does hubbling mean kind of decaying continuous decaying yeah okay. continuously cooling there's a cost of traveling and it's very much like a 
um, a, a cup of coffee that's cooling in a room that's cooler than it. And it follows a curve that's like e to the minus x. In this case, it's e to the minus ht, where a big h is one over 13.8 billion light years yeah. or years. I'm some, uh, somehow following this so far. So th this is yeah. just for my audience to say, this is the first time I'm hearing this. Um, so you're saying that instead of the, the red light coming from uh, the acceleration of these galaxies, which would, which would be a reasonable explanation ostensibly, it's actually because the further away a galaxy is, the more the light has to travel. And you're saying that when light travels, it decays into something that creates uh, a, the red color. Uh, the, the red shifting, yeah. So it's the photon is getting Hubbled. So I made up this word coming from Edwin Hubble because he made the measurements and it's on a, on a poetic, you know, it sounds like what's going on. Yeah. So, um, and this idea was originally proposed by Fritz Zwicky. He called it Lichter Mudung or light fatigue, mm -hmm. which is really elegant. You know, it's like the galaxies are more or less stationary. Some of them are drifting here and, you know, to and fro a little bit like Andromeda. Um, but the cosmic redshift is the light, in Zwicky's words, you know, it's light fatigue. The light, there's a cost to traveling. You know, there's a cost through forging a path through space. And the curve is E, which is the continuous growth number, you know, E 2.718, to the minus big H T. So yeah. it follows a curve that's like, like this. Yeah. And it's really elegant because it's just continuous decay. You know, there's no other... Um, it's like the most natural thing one can imagine. It's the same, it's almost, I think it, it's very much like the phenomenon that's like the coffee cup cooling, the law of cooling. Uh, and uh, so Fritz Wicke proposed that, but he didn't get along with the scientific establishment. Actually, no, the scientific establishment didn't get along with him. And, uh, and then a big bang cosmologist proposed it as a uh, pejorative the term light fatigue and he called it tired light. So if you're Googling this, you'll probably see the phrase tired light which is not a great name. I mean, if you're, you know, a student coming out of university and you're going to do your big thesis, you don't want to work on tired light, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it set it back a little Makes bit. Makes me sleepy just to read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can I, can I just and, jump in with a question? Um, sure. So what I, from what I'm understanding is that your idea of how the, the redshift is changing uh, as galaxies get further away or how we're perceiving the light to have changed um, follows more of a pattern where I'm trying to do it in reverse of like e to the minus x, which would be like exponentially decreasing in, in, in size instead of, I, I guess- In energy, in, in energy, yeah. In energy. Um, whereas if it were a redshift, uh, would it be more of a linear decrease in energy? Or would it be more of a linear decrease in, uh, or would it be more of a linear transition between from blue to red? It would, uh, it would be kind of curved, but then you'd get to that situation where some galaxies are moving away faster than the speed of light. Okay. And then they'd have to cover that up, the scientific, they cover up and say, oh, space expanding, and space can supposedly expand faster than the speed of light. That's their excuse. It's not a reason, it's an excuse. They say, oh, space can expand faster than the speed of light. Uh, and then, oh, let's make up some other stuff. Let's make up a bunch of other particles. Let's make up a bunch of other dark matter, dark energy, and uh, not be accountable, which is not good. And, and Fritz Zwicky had this idea for light fatigue. Uh, I'm going to call it photon hubbling or light hubbling because I think it's a great word. And, uh, and, it, and people can start trying to understand why it's happening. So this is, you know, there's a lot of, it, it, this is going to open up the doors to a lot more honest inquiry. You know, what's causing... Uh, or basically what's happening when the light's getting hubbled. Uh, so that's the core concept of the big circus model uh, in addition to the concept of eternity. So 13.8 billion years is actually the, the, um, the constant that's in that continuous decay function. So it's E to the minus uh, time traveled or distance traveled over 13.8 billion light years. So that's where that comes from. And, and in its place, um, that's how I got these ideas. So I, I wondered, you know, where does 13.8 billion years come from and why do people think it's an age? So then I realized it's, you know, as if the number as it is models the redshift really well. And I have the data on bigcircusmodel.org in the footer. There's a section for redshift and there's a Google sheet with all the supernovae data and anybody can independently verify it. 
And the data comes from the NASA extragalactic database of all the redshift objects that we know, uh, and then filtered into the supernovae. And so I thought, you know, what if 13.8 billion years is a constant? Then I thought, if it's a constant, how can it be an age? Because don't ages go up? It's like, it's like a kid's question. It's like, don't, don't ages go up? Uh, and then I thought, um, what if it's, no, what if it is a constant? And what if the universe doesn't have an age? So that was the big, uh, that was a big realization that maybe I can consider that possibility. Uh, that there's no age to the universe, and it's simply matter and energy evolving, and um, galaxies have life cycles. I mean, we see it in the sky. In the sky, we see old galaxies, we see young galaxies, we see, uh, you know, uh, young clouds of gas, we see old cl clouds of gas, and um, and the other reason that the Big Bang is probably completely false besides the requirement that things have to move faster than the speed of light. Like, can you believe that? Like the standard model, like the state of the art cosmology today is resting on faster than light as a requirement. And not enough people are concerned by this. Uh, it's a kludge. It's not, it's, it's, and it's an excuse. It's not a reason. Um, so then I thought, um, uh, what was, So the, the, besides the faster than light thing, which doesn't make sense, there are old galaxies far away. This is a very big deal. There are old mature galaxies with their stars burned out really far away. And an example of this is XMM2599, uh, galaxy XMM2599, which uh, I hope people look up and question, you know, why is there something that's a really old galaxy far away? Because the Big Bang claims that the farther you look, the younger it gets. That's what they claim. But there's an old galaxy far away. And there's not just one, there are many. OK, this is beyond my pay grade of being able to question, but please carry on and let's, let's hear, hear, the, hear it till the end. Sure. So if, there's, if there are old galaxies that are far away, that's an observational, straight up contradiction to the Big Bang. But it's not discussed because well, somebody will have to ask those cosmologists in academia one day, why aren't they talking about it? And then why are they, what's going on? Um, and by the way, to just set the tone or set the stage, you know, uh, I'm not like some, uh, um, you know, so flying solo here. Like there are numerous intelligent uh, astrophysicists, and astrophysicists and cosmologists questioning the standard model. And that's why I'm doing this. Now, I've read what they're saying. I see what they're saying. I see the evidence they're approaching, you know, they're coming at this with. And I see that they just don't understand social media, so they're not going to go anywhere. Uh, and they can't change the funding structures in academia. So it has to come from the outside, and it has to be a bottom-up a bottom up discussion, a bottom-up scientific revolution. So I'm not flying solo here. There are numerous, you know, there are people questioning the dark matter, which is actually, uh, there's no need for dark matter. That can be accounted for by modified gravity or MOND. Uh, there's no need for dark energy. Wait, sorry, say that sentence again. That can be accounted for by what? By uh, a modification to GM over R squared, classic gravity. And it's called, the, the, the acronym for it is MOND, M-O-N-D. Okay. And it was invented by Modi Milgram 30 or 40 years ago. And there's a really, um, it, it's, it's quite, uh, you know, it's quite sad that it, you know, Milgram's been at this for 40 years and, and people aren't, uh, giving it the respect it deserves. Uh, I mean, it actually works. So you look at the data of the rotation of galaxies. So where, do, where does that come from basically? So they look at galaxies and galaxies are a bunch of stars swirling around each other. That's really what it is. Uh, so they look at the speeds of the stars swirling and they, and they you know, wondered uh, why are they going so fast? Why are they going faster than if you just use acceleration equals GM over R squared, which is, it works in the solar system. It works, you know, satellites around the earth. So why is it faster than that? And then what the, what the people in Big Bang cosmology said is um, there's actually, there's, there's this invisible matter. It's called dark matter. It doesn't interact with anything. And it's in these patches around the galaxy. And we're going to use machine learning to figure out, you know, where these invisible blobs of dark matter are and make the, and make the, and that extra mass is supposedly going to account for the extra, extra speed. So that, that's literally what they do. It's, it's mind-boggling that it's given the prestige it is when it's really 
it's post facto curve fitting with nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and, so, and, so, and so just to, just to yeah. clarify on that, what you're saying is that they have these kind of set of presuppositions of this, the big bang theory model must be correct. And when they find a contradiction, they just keep inventing new variables to, to make it fit together. It's, it's almost an exact replay of the, what was going on in the geocentric model times where they're like, oh, we're going to invent, uh, oh, that, uh, that other planet, oh, that other planet takes an extra loop and goes, still goes around, goes around the earth. And, um, and, and what's really nice about the, um, you know, tr in searching for a solution is that things get simpler. You don't have so many arbitrary parameters. You don't have so many ad hocs, uh, things converge and there's a simpler truth there. So what's really beautiful about the uh, heliocentric model, just from the fact that planets are going around this gigantic sun, is that it, unif it, it makes gravity really elegant because then you can think of gravity as simultaneous attraction everywhere of every atom. So naturally, when there are more atoms in one place, that's like the center of mass and things go around that big thing. So it's like, it's a unifying thing and it's a simplifying thing. So in the case of uh, letting go of galactic recession, letting go of space expanding, which doesn't make any sense. It's, it's space expansion is a kludge. And it's, I'm still shocked that it's, um, that like, you know, people in their suits and ties are like, oh, space is expanding. And, and if you're, you must be an amateur who doesn't know anything if you don't believe space. Um, and uh, so it, it, what, what makes that really elegant by replacing it with light hubbling. So the light, galaxies are basically stationary. There are old galaxies and young galaxies far away. So there's a distribution of young and old galaxies throughout the universe, which makes any point in the universe like a snapshot in eternity. Mm. And light simply decays as it moves. You know, there's a cost of traveling and it actually fits the data and you don't need arbitrary parameters for every galaxy. And uh, to, to close the loop on, the, uh, on dark matter versus mond, so how do you account for these stars going a little bit faster? It's not just GM over R squared. The, the function that is speculated to be the true one that is uh, that models hundreds of galaxies is actually approximately the square root of GM over R squared times a constant. So how cool is that? They just take GM over R squared, multiply by a constant, and then take a square root, and that actually models the galactic rotation curves. So now the question should be, what's going on? You know, why is it that constant? And there are many interesting ideas there, and I'd love to go down that path when, when curious. I'm um, very curious now, but forgive me as, I, as I'm trying to also still process exactly what you're saying. So yeah. maybe to reiterate this, you're saying that we, ha we, have this, uh, we have this equation that describes the, the gravitational rotation of galaxies. Or yeah, giant stars going around a galaxy. Yeah. Okay. And you're saying that to reach the point where we can have an equation that would describe these stars that are going faster or seemingly faster than this equation, all we need to have is a constant and a, at a square root, apparently, and that, yeah. that accounts for it. Yeah. And what is this constant? It is the speed of light squared divided by 2 pi times 13.8 billion light years. That seems too coincidental to be nothing, I would say. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not an expert, but generally from, you know, I, I, did, I did maths and, and further maths in, uh, in high school. When there was something, you know, like a, a beautiful equation, like e to the pi i uh, equals uh, minus one, so, uh, then, you know, when I first saw that, I honestly didn't even believe it. I saw it. I just <laughs> it, it all up my all up my body. It's, it's honestly the only thing I've ever considered having tattooed on myself. Uh, I didn't get a tattoo in there, but it, it was so beautiful. I was just absolutely stunted. I was stunned. Uh, so again, I'm not I'm not saying that what you're saying is true or false because I'm a fucking ape. I have no idea what's going on. But when you find some, when you have a hypothesis and you're like, okay, there's this missing factor. And then it turns out that this missing factor is something so precise. It tends to mean that there is, there is genuinely a correlation there. Yeah. You got to ask what's going on and it's clearly working. It's actually modeling the speeds and the accelerations of those stars in hundreds of galaxies. So it's working. And the only extra parameter is one parameter and the function. 
Contrast that with the status quo, which requires new parameters for every galaxy. Isn't that strange? Like, to make it work, they have to invent new parameters for every galaxy. What, like, what do you mean by new parameters for every galaxy? You mean like a different type of dark matter or? Yeah, and where the dark matter is and, uh, and, uh, and by that, I mean, if you see a new galaxy, you can't predict it. Because they're going to be like, oh, how do I explain that new galaxy? Oh, I have to invent a new number for to explain what's going on. Whereas with modified gravity, that's like, oh, no, that same number, that same constant that we're using works there, too. So that's, that's what it means to have predictive power. So dark matter has does not have predictive power. Modified gravity or MOND has predictive power. So what happens when you, I mean, that sounds very convincing. Uh, obviously, I haven't looked at the data, so I can't, I can't speak for it. What would happen if you showed that to somebody who's more in the mainstream idea of uh, the kind of Big Bang Theory-esque? Yeah. Uh, by the way, the data for down the road, it's on bigcircusmodel.org in the footer. Uh, and, say say uh, that one more time slowly. It's the, 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 I've put all the data and analyses into Google spreadsheets and Google Colab Python notebooks, and they're linked at bigcircusmodel.org in the footer. Got it. So hopefully people can look that up. And uh, when I share this with mainstream cosmologists, they say that MOND is fringe, and they say that- I hate that word, uh, in science. They, <laughs> yeah, they say it's uh, fringe, and they say, uh, oh, they say, oh, the bullet cluster disproves it. They say something like that. Uh, but then when you respond to them and say, um, uh, yeah, fringe is fine, but fringe is not a condition for whether it's true or not. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? <laughs> fringe is not a condition for true or false. Uh, and uh, but whether it's actually working is, you know, that's a condition whether it's true or false. And, uh, and then, um, and then you can respond with uh, the, the bullet cluster is actually not a problem. I mean, if you read the works of the top Mond cosmologists, they address the bullet cluster and it's like a complete, it's like, it's justifiable uncertainty and it's a non-issue. Do you want to describe what the bullet cluster is? It's a cluster that, um, uh, there's a little bit more, uh, gravitational lensing, and they say that falsifies mind, but it doesn't falsify mind. It's just an observational anomaly. So this is, I think, a, a, a trend that happens when somebody's trying to, um, when, when there's a, they're, they're not basically, and when you respond to the solution to the bullet cluster, the mainstream cosmologists don't touch it. Like they either stop responding or they make something else up and change the subject, which is not, which is not good. So if, to people, for people to read more about this, uh, Stacy McGaw is a really good researcher. Uh, I mean, he's not really good. He is at the top of the field. And uh, Pavel what's Krupa. Name? What's his name again? Stacy McGough. McGough, like M C G A U G H. Okay. And Federico Lelli and Pavel Krupa. And um, and they've been, you know, they they are they're the reason I'm I have the confidence to to you know pursue this because they're extraordinarily intelligent. They have all the data in their favor. And they're being completely genuine and sincere and honest and going through the academic processes, but the academic processes are screwing them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I feel like I got to help them out. And, um, and uh, I've, you know, spoken with them. They're really great. You know, they have, they, they gathered the data on the rotation curves. You know, the funny thing is they gathered the data on the galactic rotation curves, you know, the, the stars spinning around the galaxy. Uh, and then, but it's, <laughs> So what you tend to find is that the people who, who do the painstaking work of getting the data and making it available uh, are, you know, they're hardcore scientists. And, um, and, and the interesting case with Stacy McGaw is that he himself started out in dark matter. He's, you know, he started his career, you know, working in dark matter. And he's like, oh, those Mon folks, they're friends, they're crazy. But then he <laughs> changed his mind and he's like, no, I know exactly what's going on and why there's miscommunication and why Mond is actually working. And, uh, but then he, he just got red pills, <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah. biggest way possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on the coincidences, yeah, co coincidences, they're not hard science, but this one is very intriguing because it's C squared over two pi times 13.8 billion light years, which looks kind of like centripetal acceleration, like V squared over R, where the V is, the, is a C, the speed of light, and the distance to the mm -hmm. center it's running around is... Uh, two pi times 13.8 billion light years and that led me to another question like you know where, where does it come from what's going at the speed of light and what's rotating around something that's uh two pi times 13.8 billion light years so i thought that uh 
maybe the dark matter, the so-called dark matter is actually the rest of the mass of the universe because the, the radius is not the distance to the center, but it's going, it's, it's like going around the other way and coming back. So that's where the two pi times 13.8 billion hours come. So that's the rough idea. Oh, right, right. Slow, slow down for a second for my, sure. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and probably for my audience as well. You know, we're poker players, you know, a lot of us, yeah. we're, we're pretty slow on anything that isn't trying to sniff out bluffs and whatnot. So you're saying that the, uh, the gravitational uh, equation for galaxy spin is very similar to the equation for centripetal, you call it centri, I don't know how Americans pronounce it, but centripetal force. Uh, which is, you know, shit going around in a circle and the force that goes in on the insides. And you're saying that the missing factor of the equation or something like that was that it looked like the age of the universe, but it was actually the mass of the universe that's going around the other way. Or, or did you mean like going around the rest of the universe? So that, that's the bit that yeah. kind of confused me. Yeah. That maybe that constant was hinting at something and maybe that something was, was that the, the radius of that centripetal acceleration, C squared over 87 billion light years. So maybe that 80, 87 is two pi times 13.8 approximately. So yeah. C squared over 87 billion light years. So what is 87 billion light years away? You know what's what's going on there so i thought about um well let's go back to basics let's go back to basics what is the r in gm over r squared so <laughs> the radius to the center of mass yeah right so if you're doing um the earth going around the sun or the moon going around the earth it's going at a speed and it's going around a radius and that radius for the earth is you know how far away from the sun mm -hmm. and uh and um and then M is all the mass that's within the circle of the orbit that's pulling it in. And of course, the mass outside the orbit is attracting it. But if you're, if, there, if there's a circle of mass outside you, it's essentially, there's no, there's a, there's basically no net effect because if you're, if you're here and there's a circle of mass yeah, around, yeah. around you, it cancels to zero. So it's really the mass that's within you is what can be pulling you in, uh, within your orbit can be pulling you in. So that's, so the R is that, that's the R to the center of mass. So now what is 87 billion light years? What's that doing there? So this is you know, a wild idea, but what if it's kind of like, if you, if you fly around the earth, you end up where you started. What if that's the case with 3D space, where if you go sufficiently long in 3D space somewhere, you end up where you are, abstractly. Mm -hmm. And what if that number is 87 billion light years? So, what if that constant is kind of like going to the center of the galaxy, but the other way? That like is. instead of flying from, instead of flying from Boston to New York, the shortest way, you're going the other way. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's maybe that's what's going on with the 87 billion light years. So maybe the universe is, the universe has the shape of a hypersphere and the hypersphere's radius is 13.8 billion light years. What's a hypersphere? A hypersphere is a shape where every point in a 3D volume is equidistant from some point. Okay. All right. So just a... so you get going up, you know, going up, no, going up from a circle to a sphere to a hypersphere. So well, wait, every, every is, point in a 3D volume, it, wouldn't a sphere yeah. all be equidistant to the center? A uh, sphere is for a 2D surface, right? Every point, a sphere is a, is a shape such that every point on a 2D surface is equidistant from a point. Oh, so it's a, it's a hypersphere kind of next four dimensional thing. Yeah, oh. that's the speculation that I have. I don't know if it's true, but it's a speculation because that 87 billion light years is so beautiful, two pi times three pi. So I thought it's like, you know, going to the center of the galaxy, but the other way. And, and, if, and if that's the case, then, you know, what's going on there? So without inventing some other random arbitrary thing, like what if, what if that's actually the rest of the mass of the universe? So it's the rest of the mass of the universe is kind of causing that extra speed up. So maybe the dark matter of a galaxy is just the rest of the mass of the universe for that galaxy. And what's, and, it's, and this unifies a lot of things. It's definitely 
conceptually i'm feeling it i'm digging it i have no idea if what you're talking about actually makes sense uh because would you I get the rough I idea probably... of if you go far enough one way you might end up where you started yeah yeah no I, I i understand conceptually what you're saying i'm just i just mean that you know if i i'm not a theoretical physicist or a cosmologist so i i, I don't have the intellectual capacity to be able to rebut this Let, let's go on to if we are trying to combat the the big bang theory that means a lot of or that means all of the the proof the quote unquote proof of the big bang theory is false and one of the reasons why this is such a giant to try and take down conceptually is because there's a lot of consilience between different uh, independent studies or concepts that have all pointed towards uh, the big bang theory at least that's what people say and uh, consilience for people at home is like when you have a lot of independent factors all pointing towards the same kind of theory or the same kind of point. Um, so I wouldn't be able to list all of the different reasons uh, for why the Big Bang Theory is is there, but I'm sure you could. And do you want to kind of rebut them? Uh, you know, the background radiation, things like that. Yeah, those are the two big things, the redshift and the cosmic radiation, the cosmic uh, microwave, the cosmic radiation, which peaks in the microwave spectrum. I think that's really what's going on. It's because people keep saying, uh, you know, cosmic microwave background, but they forget there's other, uh, you know, the radio waves, there's, you know, slightly higher than microwave. Uh, so it's a cosmic radiation which peaks in the microwave range. Hmm. And uh, so the redshift is what they said, oh, maybe galaxies are flying away. Therefore, if you rewind time, everything was at a single point. That's the Big Bang, you know, so that's what, so that's their logic. So, but that, uh, you know, galactic precession does make sense. Space expanding does make sense. So that redshift is actually in favor of a dynamical equilibrium or eternal model like the big circus uh, and then the other thing is the cosmic radiation which you mentioned and so what's going on there what's going on there is if you look up at the night sky it's not um i mean there, there's there's some heat coming from somewhere so the they ex, the, the the big bang explains that as leftover radiation from a hypothetical from a hypothetical big bang that's what they say uh however and then they cite to uh, Penzias and Wilson's famous experiment where they measured, you know, there's like some statics. Oh, what's the static going on? Uh, and then, oh no, maybe it's this uh, cosmic radiation. Um, so that was a great experiment, but it's not proof of the Big Bang. It just means that there is cosmic radiation. So the question is, where is it coming from? So that's a good, you know, base camp, right? You know, where is the cosmic radiation coming from? So then I looked at that question because I came at this, I came at this, you know, I went to, you know, you know, I went to high school here. I went, you know, went to college here. You know, I read, you know, I listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson. I try to get familiar with what's going on. And I thought, I, I, got to be honest, I have love for every single human on earth. Something about Neil deGrasse Tyson just, it makes me, ugh. there's something about it that it really irritates me. And that's my, <laughs> that's nothing to do with him. That's my fault completely for not being able to handle it. <laughs> There's something about that guy that just rubs me the wrong way. So I can feel my bias already, hoping that you're right and he's wrong. <laughs> he, um, I have a soft spot. I mean, he, he, uh, and he was responsible for the Hayden Planetarium, and I love the Hayden Planetarium. So, I, he, but I see where you're coming from. I hope he changes his mind. And I think <laughs> he can change his mind. You know, he can write another book and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and sell another book. <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, did you see him on uh, on Joe Rogan? Like he was that, that, cutting off Joe Rogan a lot. That's where my my opinion kind of formed. Like he was just cutting him off. It's not nice. Is the biggest uh, interrupter I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> there's a, there's a video exactly that. You know, I think that's the one I saw. <laughs> and it's just uh, Joe getting increasingly <laughs> more agitated as time goes on. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I I trust you know status you know scientists you know they're they're smart. They I mean the reason we have these old you know fantastic gadgets and and chips and smartphones. Uh, so then I looked at the cosmic microwave background, uh, the cosmic radiation, which peaks in the microwave range. And uh, believe it or not, you know, 50 years before Penzias and Wilson, the, 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 the steady state people were saying, oh, there should be something, there should be some cosmic radiation. Hmm. So this is before the Big Bang. People before the Big Bang thought there would be cosmic radiation. So it's clearly not proof of the Big Bang exclusively. Where, so, where, where did they hypothesize that this would come from, or why did they believe it had to be there? From other stars. Just the decaying of other stars, or are they just emitting radiation because they're big motherfuckers? Uh, from regular starlight. 
Okay. And that, that just has some level of uh, radiation that peaks at microwave. Yeah. All right. I'll, uh, I have no idea if that's true, but <laughs> they, they use a few other words, okay. which is maybe from, take it from the other perspective, which is, okay, let's say it was actually zero Kelvin. Let's say it was totally nothing. Uh, but again, again, you probably want to define Kel Kelvin just being kind of like zero temperature, like the coldest temperature, kinetic energy. Yeah. 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 Energy density, energy in a volume that there's no energy in a volume, but, uh, that's, um, but then how would that happen? It would be like totally, that only, you, you can't be disconnected from the rest of the universe. Like yeah. there has to be some that's cushioning, you know, temperature kind of thing. Yeah. So that's, that's where that idea comes from. I mean, that makes sense intuitively as in there has to be something coming from the stars, even if it's like the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest smidgen, it's not going to be zero carbon. Yeah. And uh, they use a few other words to describe this. Like it's the thermalization of all starlight um, or uh, there are a few other really good, you know, uh, words too. And, and then they, uh, they also talk about the, uh, the, there's a word they call the power spectrum, but the power spectrum is not exclusive proof of, proof of a big bang. It just means there's an angular power spectrum and that can very easily be explained by star. It's, it's starlight. Uh, it's, um, and, uh, so basically these are areas for good inquiry you know i don't have all the answers these are good things to investigate but just let it be evident to everybody that steady state cosmologists proposed the cosmic radiation first and it was consistent with their ideas so to answer your original question you know the big bang one of the best th things supporting big bang they say the redshift but no it doesn't work you know it's not proof of it they say the cosmic radiation but no that's not proof of it uh they also say uh I mean, they say, uh, we see young stuff that's far away, but uh, no, that's clearly false. We see old galaxies far away. Uh, we see young and old galaxies far away. And, um, and then they say, uh, and then going back to light hubbling or what they call it as tired light, because a lot of the conversation is basically that it's, it's going to like, there'll be a focal point on tired light. Yeah. I've got a question. I've got a question. Okay. So if the hypothesis is correct, if the theory is correct, what you would expect to see is at least a disproportionate amount of the galaxies that are far away are young. Do you see that? Do you see that they're the, the further away you get on average, the more young they are and the, you know, the anomalies could just be observational anomalies, or is it kind of like an even scattering? Yeah, it's good. It's a really good question. Uh, and the web telescope will help with that. We'll, we'll get better pictures of galaxies. It, um, there's some papers that say that there are things kind of get younger far away. Uh, but that paper also acknowledges that the reason for that is that it's harder to see old galaxies because their stars have burned out. Mm. So naturally you're going to see a bit fewer. Ooh. However, uh, which is, I mean, it's clearly harder to see old galaxies. However, they're proof by existence. There are old galaxies far away. So even if there's one, that's a very big problem for the Big Bang. Hmm. And it's not just one. I mean, there was, I think there could be yeah. some kind of uh, some kind of influence that would be able to mean that there might be a, a few anomalies or a few uh, exceptions to the rule. There couldn't be some kind of force, some kind of big catastrophic event of galaxies colliding and one flying off into the other direction. There's there's nothing that might account for that. Um, then you'd have to invent another. A new, a new incredible particle, a new incredible, uh, uh the epiphany particle, you heard it here first. A new, that, a new rule done, right? and, uh, <laughs> and, um, oh yeah, I, I guess there are multiple, I, I listed a few three on, yeah. I guess I just meant it's, anything that you're already aware of that might be able to cause that, that kind of cosmic influence, but no, it seems like, I mean, no. And, <laughs> and there was another paper that showed that at a certain particular distance, there was an equal ratio of young and old galaxies. Uh, and I like that on my Twitter. And if you search for, um, if you search for, you know, equal distribution of young and old galaxies at like Z equals 11, something like that, you'll, you'll find it. So that's another example that, oh, like there are, there are an equal distribution of young and old galaxies. So every point in space is kind of like a snapshot in eternity. Yeah. I like that sentence, by the way, you should definitely hang on to that. It's beautiful. When you write a book on this, this is, this is the one, this is a chapter heading. Um, so for me, from coming from a very, uh, you know, primitive perspective, it would seem like one of the main determining factors about to see who's right or not would be to 
falsify or verify whether there is an even scattering of young and old galaxies as distance goes, you know, as you, as you get further away. Like, it seems like if, if there is one, then the Big Bang Theory is just completely falsified. Yeah. And if there isn't, then that really lends a, lends a hand to the Big Circus Theory. No, oh, good luck. That's uh, <laughs> it would be cool, man. Like I, I can feel myself. I'm, I'm not so much of a, you know, I, I don't, I don't indulge in conspiracy theories for the sake of it. You know, there's something in me that really hates to be wrong about stuff, you know, and I, I especially when it's something that's ludicrous, but at the same time, when something kind of makes logical sense, there's a part of me that yearns for it to be true. If it's completely revolutionizing the way that we see something or the way that we do something. And, you know, just from a personal perspective, it would be beautiful for me to see this, this to be true. And, uh, I, I, I really hope that it is just in, in the sense that it would be a, a beautiful turn turning point in history and in uh, scientific history as well. And it might be the, it might be the biggest ever because I found a coincidence that relates all the fundamental constants. Wait, 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 wait. Say that, say that again one more time slowly, please. This might be the biggest scientific revolution ever because there is a coincidence that relates all the fundamental constants. All of them? All of them. <laughs> all of them? We're talking E, we're talking pi, we're talking H. We're talking G. We're talking. Yeah, if E is the electron charge, yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, let's. All let's right, it's time for it some go. show and tell. It's time. Guys for some in the guys in the Twitch chat, we'll get get some skeptical faces out in the chat whilst whilst we hear this because this is this is going to be good. I'm very curious. Get some skeptical emojis out. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. Is this coming up? Yeah, it's coming up. All right. So I wrote a post about this. There are a lot of words here. Uh, and I'd link to the redshift and rotation things that I've looked at. But this is it. Hmm. Give me a second. Give me a second. Uh, whatever I see is over the H and the M. Yeah, I'd say that adds up. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've done the quick calculation. Seems, seems legit to me. So um, you asked for a small h, here it is. You yeah, asked yeah. for an e, here's e, the electron. There's e, there's a. You asked for a 2 pi, here, or pi, here it is. Pi. Uh, you wanted a big g, here's e. a big g. <laughs> e. What's a, uh, here's your... Is m, what's m? Mass. Oh, uh, what? Is that constant? Mass of electron, mass of proton. Oh, is p, is p proton or what? What's going yep. on? Yep. Okay, okay, okay. You got your speed of light here, and you got your 13.8 billion years here. Wait, 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 just give me a second, give me a sec. If this is true, and the scientific establishment doesn't recognize it, which it doesn't, right? It doesn't, and I don't know if it's true, it's a coincidence, but it's, it's the most beautiful coincidence ever, I think. Wait, 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 if this is true, and the scientific establishment doesn't recognize it, how could you possibly show this to any scientist, and then not just be flabbergasted? What's going on here? So I have emailed hundreds of scientists in recent weeks, and um, they are so burned by previous coincidences being meaningless that they are hesitant to even consider that it's worth looking at. And how long ago did you stumble across this coincidence? Uh, maybe five months ago, six months ago. Take a photo of this, send it to my astrologer friend. That's our astronomer friend. <laughs> I'm very, very curious about this. Some somebody put this through a goddamn calculator for me, because if this is true, that surely that's just revolutionary, right? Yeah. It is it's exactly equal, like to the to the zero, to the hundred. It's exactly equal using the most precise values of all the ones, except uh H. There's there's debate about big H because it's like oh is it thirteen point eight or thirteen point nine so that's where the yeah. or somewhere in between that's where it is yeah so if you rearrange it so like big H is on the other side all of that pops out to about thirteen point eight billion light years so that's why I rearrange it like this 
So it's a ratio of radii over radii equals radii, ra radius over radius. Radius so each of these things radius. are Wait, lengths. Radii, radii. Wait, sorry, explain what that means. Radii each over radii. Lengths, I'll just say lengths. Each of these things are lengths. Yeah, okay. So this length over this length equals this length over this length. And the meaning of it is amazing. So here you have the proton charge radius. Uh, this is also a, a coincidence. I think it's a likely true coincidence because so much to talk about. I'll get back to that at some point. I also wrote about it. So the proton charge radius over a proton mass black hole radius. So you've got two extremes already. You've got something relating to charge and a proton over something related to gravity and a proton on one side. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you have a photon thing over a photon thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, and why this is unifying is that when you have an equation, it's like one can be understood in terms of all the others. So it's like 13.8 billion light years pops out of electron proton relationships. Oh, I'm getting it now. I just got goosebumps, I got full body goosebumps. That's like three quarters of my body. You didn't get, you didn't get my whole body. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get ahead of yourself. <laughs> so the relationship between, was it pro protons and photons? Yeah. A ratio of photon extremes equals a ratio of proton extremes. When you say extremes, what do you mean, sir? Like uh, they're extreme. Like here you've got the, the, the proton charge radius, which is if you bump, if you bump uh, protons or electrons off a proton, you get that radius. Uh, if you... If you take, if you think of the proton like a black hole, that's its radius. That's what I mean by extreme. You know, if, if you take the mass of a proton and, and try to compact it so it becomes a black hole, that that would have that would be its radius. And wait, wait. The other so you're, saying, you're saying if if you took a proton and you made it infinitely dense or something, what what do, what do you mean by turning into a black hole? That uh, if all that mass was within this length of a within this length, two g over c squared times mass of the proton. That's like the Schwarzschild radius of the proton. So it's an idealistic extreme. Say that one more time. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's just an idealistic extreme. So <laughs> if you take all that mass. Of which ideal? Of the proton. So the question is like, what if you could pack all the mass of a proton so tightly it became a black hole? What would the, oh. what would the size of the black hole be? It's this number. So gotcha. that's what I mean by, it's just an extreme. Uh, I don't even know if it's a real thing. It's just an idealistic extreme. Got it, got it. Uh, and on the other side, you have a photon extreme. You've got this 13.8 billion light years. And then you have the radius of, uh, if, 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 a, if, a, if an electron collides with a positron and mm -hmm. they both turn into photons, mm -hmm. that photon has a wavelength. And then if you take that wavelength over two pi, it's this number. Right, so that the whole of the, the denominator of the left is right. that. The photon of electron mass radius. So you got photon extremes equal, a, a ratio of photon extremes equals a ratio of proton extremes. So just to clarify for my stupid audience who haven't got it, like I have, uh, <laughs> so the, the equation that you've f come across, you've stumbled across, would it, it ties up very neatly all of these unique numbers, these constants that are throughout our universe, like pi and e, uh, which, are ever ch which are never changing, ever existing, uh, infinitely existing, and... Um, something that we're all very familiar with if we if we've done any any kind of rudimentary maths or physics you've tied you've found something that ties them all up with what's supposedly a non-constant if you were to listen to the big bang theorists these conspiracy theorists these <laughs> these fringe people uh they would say that big h changes over time meaning that in 20 billion years this equation would fall apart because H would be 20 billion bigger or something like that. Yeah. Like it would go up or something. Yeah. It would, yeah, it would change. It would change. It would change in some way. And, uh, just, ju just to be clear, if, if we went 20 billion years in the future, H would be significantly different. Is what they'd say. Yeah. 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 So ju just, sorry, just, just to clarify, so I could be a hundred percent certain in, in my kind of synopsis here. The, what what is the definition of big H? Is that just the is that just thirteen point eight billion? Yeah, and where that comes from is this.
is uh, which tab is showing up? Uh, I'm seeing a video of the big circus and now your spreadsheet. Uh, someone in the Twitch chat could just run the numbers on this, just to make sure it's right. I'm sure, I'm sure you just get your calculators out. 200. Yeah. All right. So this is the redshift data. And uh, the blue dots are the actual data. Mm -hmm. The orange is what galactic recession would have you believe. And red is light fatigue or light hubbling. Mm. Wait, so what, what, are the, what are the blue dots data of? A supernovae redshift. Okay. So you take the energy of the light that hit your telescope divided by the energy of the light when it was emitted. So energy observed over energy emitted. And it starts at one, like 100%, and then it goes down. Right. So that's so what it, we mean by continuous decay. So the, the just to clarify, the yellow line is what the Big Bang theorists would suggest is correct. And because they uh, this doesn't really match the data, they came up with, from your perspective, they, they, they kind of just man, manufactured... Uh, dark energy, which would kind of yoink that line back up to the the blue dots. Is that correct? They manufactured um, space expanding to make up for it. Space expanding. Okay. Gotcha. And, uh, gotcha. and space expanding faster than the speed of light. So just to be clear, what I'm up against, I'm a fringe, you know, maybe you can call me fringe or you can call me amateur, but <laughs> I'm up <laughs> against... Steps go that thinks space expanding faster than the speed of light is what it takes to explain the universe. So uh, I think it's a, it's an easy fight. It should be an easy fight. <laughs> yeah, on, on paper, it might look like it. I will say that we have to be humble and, and understand that perhaps space does expand faster than the speed of light. We don't. <laughs> we, we, we honestly, we can't say with, with a huge degree of certainty that it's impossible, despite it going against, you know, Einstein's theories and whatnot. Um, you know, we, the, the, there could be some 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 reality in the, that this is true, that the space does expand faster than the speed of light. Uh, yeah, well, I hope to, you know, have a conversation with some of them at some point, you know, because we got to figure out what's going on. And maybe my most favorable explanation for what's going on is that it's basically um, people having to trust their mentors and the people who had to sign up on their PhDs. So they basically got trapped into having to agree with their superiors. So they just went with it. Yeah. And, uh, and I also found something really, really strange, which is that Edwin Hubble himself wrote multiple times that the exploding universe is dubious and disturbing. He said dubious and disturbing. <laughs> he said disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> Edwin Hubble, the guy who got this data in the first place. Uh, and, uh, However, all the popular scientist videos and academic scientists, yeah, they say that Hubble proved the universe was expanding, which that's is ridiculous. I, he said the exact what, opposite. That's what I was taught. <laughs> that's what I thought too. So when I found Hubble actually writing in his, you know, in his, um, uh, both in his, in his books and in newspaper clippings where he's quoted, you know, primary, you know, where he is quoted, he says, uh, there's no basis for this exploding universe. So what the hell is going on in the history of science where somebody's words are twisted to mean to say the opposite? So that's when I knew that it's, it's, um, it's more than a scientific bureaucracy problem. It's, it's a historical accounting problem. Do you, you, are you claiming that there's any amount of like intentional foul play or do you think it's just kind of mass incompetence on a grand scale? Uh, definitely mass incompetence on the grand scale. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe something else yeah you never you never know that's the that's a fun thing about conspiracy theorizing you never know <laughs> but how exactly you know what's going on why is hubble's you know why why is it on why do most people think hubble's you know, why do why do people in at the height of academia say that hubble proved the universe is expanding what you know that doesn't make that's like really sad that the exact opposite is being repeated uh so the the thirteen point eight billion light years uh, years is the is the um, coefficient to the continuous decay that gets the red uh, that gets the uh, red trend trend dots. Oh, really? So do you see this right here? The um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, e yeah. to the minus h t. So that's that's where the big h is. 
Oh. So to just just to clarify, I'm not misunderstanding this. The the reason that the red is, is actually kind of underneath where you'd expect the middle of the line to go through the blue is proportionate to uh, e to the minus ht. Sorry, say that again. <laughs> so if, if if there were no kind of light decay, um, you would expect the the line to just go straight through the middle of the the blue dots, right? Uh, it would just be at 100%. It would just go like that. Give me a second. Give me a second. But, so you're, but you bring up a question, you know, why is it slightly lower? Yeah, that's exactly this. That's a good question. And I'm, I'm, you know, looking into that too. Uh, maybe it's the distance measurements, because by the way, two, two times 10 to the 17 seconds is kind of like, or three times 10 to the 17 seconds is about 10 billion light years away. So it's already really far. So maybe our measurements have to, maybe it's a measurement error. I don't know. Uh, but that's a good point. You know, why is it slightly lower? Uh, however, I am confident in 13.8 billion light years because it, it fits the beginning really well, where our measurements are more precise. Right. So that's that makes, what that makes sense. So I trust these a little bit more than these numbers, which yeah. is, this is already, uh, already 10 billion light years away. Mm. Uh, and, um, so to answer your question, yeah, that's where the big H comes from. It's the coefficient of continuous decay. Right. And that's why, uh, this number is what it is. And that's why I thought, hey, you know, what if it's a constant? What if it's not an age? I mean, surely, it, I mean, ju just this alone intuitively would show me that H is a constant. Like, it, it just, I can't see any, any universe where something would fit together so perfectly, but then it would just, the, the, the equation would just deteriorates as, as time goes on. Again, exactly. Again, I'm just speaking as a, as a complete ape here. I've no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. I'm sitting in a fucking galaxy hoodie, but the, the perfection of the, the mathematic and the geometric, uh, phenomena within the universe is so gorgeous and so precise and so unexplainable, at least in, in current times that when you see something like e to the pi i equals minus one, or where you see something like this equation fit together so perfectly it would take an extraordinary amount of arrogance even to imagine that it's not actually correct and that it would just change and deteriorate over time. Now, again, I'm speaking to somebody that doesn't know anything about what I'm talking about, but to me, that seems like, I mean, this is one of the biggest things that discoveries that science has seen. Yeah. And um, what makes this different from other people who have challenged the status quo is that hopefully I'm setting, I'm indicating that there's a way to, to move forward. Because when people call out, other people have called out the problems I'm calling out the Big Bang, like the old galaxies far away, the faster than light kludge, and, uh, and, uh, and then the cosmic radiation actually being proposed by steady state before Big Bang, and then also uh, Hubble's words being twisted. So other people pointed this out before me, but they didn't have this anchoring equation coincidence that, maybe big H comes from atomic properties. Uh, and by the way, do you know, you know, what is the electron and the proton, but the fundamental atom hydrogen? Say that right. again. The electron and proton are basically hydrogen, right? The electron going yeah, around yeah. the proton. Yeah. And how cool is it that 13.8 uh, billion light years pops out of relationships from the fundamental atom? Mm, that is really cool. That is really neat. In fact, I, I bet that there's, a hundred different ways that you could view or a hundred different lenses you could view this equation and say, isn't that really cool that that relates to that? Well, <laughs> so what, what happens when you show this equation to people who are kind of on board with the, the big circus theory? If they're on board with the big circus model, uh, and I'm calling it model because it can be updated as we go along. And it's, 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 it sounds more flexible than theory, which sounds like it's, I like, I like that. I like that. And, um, and, uh, the, uh, so what do people say? They say, uh, people who are already on board, they're like, oh yeah, I see. I completely see why you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> uh, but, and then, but, but people, they just kind of like drop their mugs after taking a sip and be like, holy shit, this, this equation ties together the reality of all of these constants and is so beautiful and neat and revolutionary have there not been any like heart attacks on the spot or any <laughs> tried to like kill you and take take credit for it or something like that <laughs> there there might be 
some people like paralyzed with Chuck, but they either haven't told me or they are trying to come to make more discoveries, which is a good thing. So I bet I bet there's 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 a phenomenon in the poker industry where everyone's when they're when they're playing like a high stakes tournament. You imagine you sometimes get in this position where you're playing for stakes four times bigger than your net worth in in one tournament and yet everyone's fucking sweating it you're like they're they're really invested in this moment right now but there's this unspoken thing that happens between 90 something percent of poker players where everyone's trying to look like they care the least <laughs> because they don't want to be the guy that's like oh my god there's really fucking cool i might be able to win a million dollars holy shit um, maybe, maybe that's what's happening when you're showing this to the, the other scientists, you know, they're like, yeah, no, it seems about right. Yeah. All the concepts <laughs> kind of fit together. It's, it's kind of, yeah, I see this shit every day. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a scientist myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to work with them. I want to, I'm thinking about from the very practical perspective, we have to hold a huge conference, something like the Solvay conferences. Maybe this could be the circus conference. <laughs> the, the mainstream media is just going to call you the clown show. You got to watch out for the PR on this. So I'll use that to my advantage <laughs> because <laughs> news articles these days are printed based on what the machine learning algorithms think people will click on. And uh, the word circus. Oh, it's so clickable these days. Everyone's yeah. calling everyone a clown. So. Um, you know, there's, um, the, I, I also like the, the many positive connotations of the word circus, including the performative aspects and the fact that there are these incredibly talent, uh, amazingly talented trapeze artists, uh, bouncing acts and, um, and it's kind of physics, you know, a circus is physics. Like Super people are, it's a physics show. Uh, juggling, unicyclists, it's, this is what it's all about. It's like, how, it's actually on multiple levels, what's important. Yeah, and, it's, it's like all of these different acts rule of these different constants and eventually they, they come together in this like almost familial aspect where everyone's just kind of joining together and it all ties into one beautiful circus. And the show goes on, you know, there's, it's, there's always a time of the circus. And I found out that, uh, uh, have, you, have you heard of Cirque du Soleil? Yeah, yeah. One of the, yeah, one of the, the one of the actually the the uh, the founder of it. He's uh, he's big into poker. And I I I realized that, and I also realized he's passionate about space travel too. Uh, he went to the International uh, Space Station. Uh, he's also passionate about uh, solving or tackling homelessness, which is something I'm I'm spending a lot of my time on. So yeah, yeah. Shout shout out to Guy La, La Liberté. And. Uh, I mean, he set the tone for the circus. Like, he's made it cool and vibrant. So uh, that's the attitude of the circus that I really like. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I think a circus conference is in order. And <laughs> now the question is, uh, uh, you know, who, who are we going to invite? Uh, who, who's going to contribute the most? Who's, you know, open-minded? Who's, um... and unlike the Solveig conferences, we got to invite some young people too. You know, not all these, you know, uh, white beards and, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, and uh, so the, you know, what are other people's reactions? So I've also shared this with uh, people who are uh, in, in MOND, Modified Gravity Cosmology. And uh, there's still some doubt because it's, they are still somewhat attached to Big Bang, the Big Bang framework. And because they can't outright say the Big Bang has these severe contradictions and we should let go of it. They can't say that yet because their funding is tight. I mean, it, they have to go through the peer review process, right? Every time and, yeah, and who, they have to apply to grants. Peer review this? Like if they attach their name to it, they're risking their career, right? Right. So I have to come from the outside. I have but to- You gotta, you gotta go ground level up. We gotta use Twitch, right? We gotta use- uh, <laughs> and, we, and, we, and we have to appeal to common sense and not rules and notation. And and so modified gravity, the mon the mon folks, I think uh, 
I think I hope they come around because they 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 gave me the confidence that uh, oh, Big H shows up in galactic rotation. So it shows up in two places. It doesn't just show up in redshift. It shows up in rotation, and it and it and it removes another kludge. You know, you don't need this dark matter. It's just oh, maybe there's maybe there's something else causing the pulling, and maybe it's actually the rest of the mass universe. All right, I've got something to admit. This whole time I've been pretending to know what kludge means. I think I think I'm getting it. I'm intuitively feeling it. But can you give me a de quick definition on that? Sure. It's it's um, it's a gigantic mess that it's a hairball. It's it's you know it's it's, it's and in another sense, it's also like spraying Febreze on a problem. <laughs> it's like oh, probably just sprayed over with Febreze and oh, it's gone away. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's like putting and a, it, and that word also comes from, from it's like putting a, a putting a bandage on an infected wound. It's a kludge. So, Okay, you're not dealing with the problem, and 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 you could actually learn something more by dealing with the problem. And uh, so, what else was relevant to that? The, uh, the the word kludge also comes from software engineering, where if people write really messy code, or they like there's a bug in the code, but they don't address it, and they just oh let's add this extra uh, extra patch or something that just temporarily patches you know covers it up. Uh, that uh, that's kludge, and. It's so like when you're cooking yeah. and something tastes like crap because you put too many ingredients in and you keep trying to balance it out with more ingredients and just like, <laughs> yeah. <it's> worse. <laughs> yeah. Or if you're mixing paints and you try to make like a light blue and then it ends up kind of green and you have to put something else and it ends up brown. Fucking kludge. <laughs> I mean, come on, faster than light. Uh, it's basically <laughs> faster than light. And it, so basically it's, it's really, it's, it's very much like the geocentric to the heliocentric revolution mm. uh, where things ultimately get simpler uh you know there's a unifying principle uh and and by the way the geocentric model it actually made very precise calculations as to the positions of the uh, planets yeah, like if you're going to calculate oh no where's the planet going to be in five days or something the geocentric calculations were quite good so that's why it had some staying power and the heliocentric model in its early days was not quite you know it, it when it, you know, where's mars going to be in, in a few days the, the geocentric guys were more precise, but of course it had to take time to catch up and, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. get the, but the framework was right. And the concept was right. And, and I think that'll be the case here. Let's talk about some of the kind of phenomenology behind the big bang. One of, one of the things that I, I was going to ask and somebody in the Twitch chat actually wanted to ask before you turned up is the, the idea that a lot of people claim that the big bang is, is, is this kind of story, this explanation that really explains the, the origins of the universe. And, you know, a lot of atheists used to, or still probably point to that and say, well, you know, there's no, there's no divine creativity. There's no divine intervention because we've now proven that we know where the universe comes from and it's the big bang. And there's always that question that's lingering behind it is like, well, what created the big bang? You know, like what, what made there be this infinitely dense amount of shit together that had this kind of, all of these mathematical constants built into this infinitely dense point that was just going to expand, uh, in the way that it did and create all of these wonderful things around us, like Twitch and whatnot, uh, and YouTube, shout out to YouTube, uh, which this is going to be on as well. Uh, so. I think that one of the, one of the issues I've had with people who, who like to kind of point to the big bang as an explanation is that it still comes with a lot of, it's an incomplete data set. You know, there's, there's, there, there are a bunch of different things that we still don't know, even if the big bang theory were true and it, it, it doesn't give us a full picture of what happened. And, uh, I think people that are they're kind of attached to this idea, and again, I'm, I'm, I've no idea what's correct. I still have no fucking idea. Uh, but a lot of people that are very attached to this idea kind of see it as this complete answer. We know where the universe came from. It was the Big Bang. And that's, that's kind of done. We don't speak about it anymore. Yeah, it's like, what happened at the beginning? We did conservation of energy. What happened to conservation of energy? It's like, no, conservation of energy is always true. So if you go back in time, it's like, where did that come from? Oh, there's something before that. So I think time goes infinitely back. And we'll go infinitely forward. And it's like, we're at the center of infinity. Yeah. And the, the second thing that I, I really, I really had, have had an issue with, with the big bang. And I say issue, I just, it was a question more than an issue, but the idea that if time is a singularity and not a linearity, 
then how could there be a beginning and an end of the universe if beginning and end are exactly the same thing? Like we're, we're seeing it, at least from my perspective, I think we're seeing it from a human perspective. You know, we have a beginning, we have an end. Whereas if I, if I, if I'm correct on this, which I, I believe that science is, is kind of an agreement that time is a singularity, then there's no such thing as a beginning. There's no such thing as an end, which means that, you know, space time itself is, is, you know, it, it doesn't exist past, present and future. It just is. Uh, do you think that that, that kind of, uh, I don't know if epistemological is the right word, but that, no, that, I'm with you on that. I'm with you. I would only add that. Don't forget like the sun has a life cycle. Like, you know, the, so there was a time when there was no sun and there's a time where the sun, you know, gets really big, red right, giant. <laughs> so there are life cycles and the earth has a, you know, it, the, there was a, the earth formed at some point, you know, a bunch of rocks coming together and then, you know, water, uh, you know, collisions with bodies carrying water, you get the oceans. And then, you know, there's the kind of its life cycle. Uh, but the whole universe is eternal. Yeah. And so the, 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 the different, the variable there would be that, you know, the earth and the sun, they're cyclical, but they, they don't hold the fabric of time within them. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, time's running everywhere, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, as in like, they, they, yeah. aren't, they, they aren't creating the definition of time. Like the universe yeah. is time. It is everything. Yeah, you can start your clock by counting something else that's ticking, you know, instead of the sun, earth going around the sun, uh, you could count, um, you could count the sun going around the sun of the galaxy, and that'll be like one tick, you know, going around. So, so time is really about when you want to start counting, and then you just count in a periodic fashion. Yeah, I think we're speaking about two, two kind of different concepts here. J just to clarify, the, the point that I'm making is that the, 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 the perception of time from humans seems to be that we're living in this kind of like three-dimensional landscape where time goes from A to B to C to D to E. Whereas from what I understand, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, from what I understand, science seems to, seems to point to A, B, C, D, E coexist. They, they aren't separate. They, it doesn't. I, like that. Uh, I think one reason I'm a little skeptical of that is, uh, Stephen Wolfram's computational irreducibility concept, where you kind of have to play things out to see what'll happen. So even if you have a, a system like, like the weather tomorrow, right? The weather tomorrow where the clouds are gonna be, not, not from like a weather report, you know, oh, it's gonna be cloudy, but like actually the molecules of the cloud, you know, where the cloud molecules are gonna be. That has to happen. So it's not like it's, it, it is not a predetermined singularity. It's, it's to be determined. That, that would be from a humanistic perspective though. You know, if, you know, if you think of a, a flatland creature that's only living in two dimensions, then you think of a human living in three slash kind of four dimensions. And then you imagine a creature that maybe is living in 12 dimensions, perhaps they would be able to flow through time and the, the, the cloud raining on, on Friday and the cloud not existing on Thursday would actually just melt into one. And I, from what I understand and uh, from, from kind of theoretical physicists that I've, I've read uh, about and uh, heard from, is that this is, this is generally widely accepted. And this is one of the, the reasons that, one of the reasons that it's accepted is that time you know, slows down as you get towards a, lot, a large, uh, uh, like mass or, or if you're going extremely close to the speed of light, for instance, then, uh, then time slows down. You know, the, the reason that astronauts come back, uh, is it younger than they actually, yeah, I think it's younger than they would have been if they stayed on earth, you know, the, those kind of, uh, phenomena. And yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. And I, I, I don't think it's like, and maybe you're saying the same thing, but I don't think it's predetermined. You know, I don't think it's like that. I think it's, I'm not saying, I don't think, like, saying I don't think the past, present, and future at a single point, if that's what you're, because it's not, I don't think it's like past, present, and future at a single point. I think there, if there's a present and then there's a future. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess this is probably a conversation for off, off Twitch because, uh, it's, a, it's something I think about a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. The, the idea of how, um, the universe could exist in, in a way that's kind of superhuman perception. 
um, and, the, and the way that things could travel through time in ways that we don't fully understand because we're stuck in this kind of human mass, this, this little meat sack that sees things in a, in a very linear perspective. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's something I think that if we, uh, we probably want to we clarify after we speak about this, uh, this fucking potentially world changing phenomenon that you've, uh, you've stumbled across. So let, let's go on to what do you think the next steps are? Are you, do you want to debate someone that's a big bang theorist? Do you want to have a platform to, to create some sparks and see what happens and see which kind of theory comes up on top? Uh, or do you want to kind of just accumulate all of the people that are with you, raise some money and then start a convention and start getting the word out like that? What, what, what do you, or maybe a multiple approach, uh, pronged attack. What you just said is maybe the only way it can work. So get together a group of people, raise money, show that there's a funding route for scientists, hold a, the circus conference. And uh, like, maybe you can fly people out and, you know, figure out how to do that. And, and then, and then it's a whole new world. You know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it's going to be based on common sense and it's going to, the data is modeled by the, uh, the simplest, most self-consistent ideas. And that it's, It's going to have an effect, a, a very positive effect on our self-perception because the Big Bang was kind of fatalistic in that it, it, it speculates this is going to be a heat death of the universe. Whereas, uh, and, uh, and that there are these new numbers coming out for every situation that uh, there's no unifying principle. Whereas, in the big circus model, the universe is eternal and there's no heat death of the universe. Yeah, that's pretty cool. There's uh, there's no, uh, there's no final chapter of humanity. If we manage to spread our seeds across the whole universe, you know, we, uh, we don't have that kind of, uh, dreaded existential ending point of, uh, even if we manage to spreads across the entire universe everything's eventually going to separate so far outwards that we're all just going to fall into dust or the the universe is going to contract to a point that just com compounds us all into this uh <laughs> one very hot <laughs> little soup yeah oh you asked what else like uh, would be cool what would be cool is uh to do a debate with neil degrasse tyson <laughs> 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 Somebody make it happen. I don't know if I have that that bigger uh, that bigger reach, but uh, it, would you would you actually like a debate if we if I found uh, you know a platform or you know some, somewhere that would would suit it with with somebody who is a, a very uh, big proponent of uh, of uh, the the Big Bang Theory? I'd be all in. And thanks thanks for the poker shout out there, by the way. <laughs> and maybe. Um... And maybe before that, ask Dr. Tyson what he thinks about Galaxy XMM2599, the old galaxy far away. Stars have burned out. It's very far away. What's going on? Next time he has he has a news conference, I'm, I'm coming at him with that one. <laughs> XMM2599. <laughs> like, what, are you a robot? <laughs> no, it's just a galaxy. Yeah. That, what, what, what is the... I guess just to go back to that, what what would be the the scientist's explanation for uh, for that? And what and and while I'm while I'm uh, while while you're saying that, guys in the in the Twitch chat, we can edit this for YouTube later. Uh, but guys in the Twitch chat, if you have any questions now, now's probably a good time to to throw them at us. What do you think they would say? I think that scientists would say either fuck off. Or they would say something along the lines of, I don't have time for this because this is probably just some kind of observational anomaly that isn't, isn't worth my time looking at. Or they would say, I don't know. I can't think of a third. It's just too Or better. they'd make something else up. That yeah. The galaxy yeah. evolved really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> time is very quick over there, I've heard. In that and that's what they say. <laughs> 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 Wait, do they actually say the time's pretty quick over there and they're like <laughs> they they pretty much they say the galaxy evolves very quickly wow that's uh do they give an explanation of why that might happen 
No. <laughs> <laughs> it's so I'm I'm definitely familiar with the arrogance and dogmatic nature of establishment science. When somebody's career depends on being right, and when somebody's spoken about something or people have spoken about a phenomena existing for decades upon decades, it is it takes an extraordinary amount of humility, which often 99.999% of people do not have, to be able to look at data and say, you know what, I might be wrong about this. Let's look into it further. The the instinctual human reaction, unless you've found some very strong degree of spiritual growth, is to say, I I'm 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 right, and no matter what you show me, I'm, I'm going to be right. They wouldn't say that, but they would feel it. Um, so I, I would say that I I definitely am very open to the idea that the scientific establishment is completely incorrect on this. And out of respect for the human intellect, I mean, we should be honest with ourselves. All right, let's see if, uh, let's see if there are any uh, questions. Is cosmetology, <laughs> I assume you mean cosmology, a hard field to get into? I'll throw that at you. It's a, it's a, it's a question. Uh, no, and the best way to get into it is by watching space scenes from Star Wars. <laughs> uh, there's a really great Disney Plus series called Galaxy Sounds, where they take all the galaxy, the, the space scenes, and they stitch them together, so you can get in that mood. And also, experimenting with Blender. Is Blender a kind of three-dimensional oh, Siri just oh, turned on? And, uh, and then experimenting with Blender, because that gives a very good 3D intuition, which is very helpful for anything cosmological. Uh, Got to be honest, guys. Twitch ch Twitch chat the questions one of uh, super high caliber. <laughs> Somebody said, "Does Schrodinger's paradox factor into the linear slash singular debate that you two just discussed?" Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, chat. Sorry, chat. So I get. I guess just to tie up, moving forward, I, I would love to be able to help in whatever small way I can. Uh, perhaps we could, I could find somebody who's a, a vehement, uh, cosmologist that, that might, that might disagree with you and host a second debate. I would love to be able to reach out to other people I know in the, the internet, uh, world and see if anyone else will have you on their podcast as well. Cause, uh, I mean, it's fucking fascinating, man. It's, and I, I gotta be honest, you make, you make a very good guest as well. You know, I, I, I've spoken to quite a few very intelligent people. It's quite rare to get somebody that's a good entertainer and uh, and and uh, very articulate in what they're speaking about. Thanks. And I hope the circus is is a word that can open up new thinking and allow people to come into this with you know, without the stodgy old academic style stuff. And, and circus is more sensational than a big bang. So it's, you can leverage. You know, you can leverage sensationalism and it can be a good thing. Uh, and it can be rooted in truth and common sense. And, and this is, and, and it's, And I think it can it can be this it can be the start of a solution to many of the world's problems because finally our cosmology can be accurate. You know, this is understanding our place in the universe. Now we realize the universe is eternal. Our actions actually have effects, and this can be the beginning of addressing and solving many of the problems in the world because it's because our cosmology is accurate. You know. <laughs> Our cosmology can be accurate. And that can improve the quality of our decisions and everything. Yeah, you can't you can't underestimate the exponential power of truth. When when you prove one thing to be right and you start acting in, in accordance and resonant with truth, then a hundred other things might fall into place suddenly.
was debating whether to bring this up because it's a change of subject, uh, but I've been at this because of the uh, difficulty in communicating, you know, the science. And, you know, for example, I tried to communicate, share the science at Reddit and Stack Exchange and Stack Overflow, but the moderators uh, label it fringe and then block, block me. And I understand there are plenty of fringe that are crazy and conspiracy, but they should have a sufficient, you know, they, they should look at my background and realize, you know, why I'm doing this and how I'm coming at this and how I'm open-minded about it. And uh, so I decided to share something else that I know, which is I am fairly certain, and this might, people might question why I'm doing this, but the truth of the matter is because I think it's true and because it can be, I, I think there are only good outcomes out of saying this, which is I think Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin, so just completely change the subject, uh, is given his experience writing C++ code, uh, given his probable location in Van Nuys, Los Angeles, so Satoshi leaked a an IP address in Los Van Nuys, Los Angeles, uh, given his linguistic traits, such as saying the phrase order of magnitude a lot, and like bloody hard, and, uh, and, and also uh, given that he had extensive experience with money and software and the payment infrastructure and even Visa. Like he was, he was talking a lot about the Visa credit card network. I think that the one candidate that is, the one candidate that is proficient in C++ was in Van, Van Nuys, California, Van Nuys, Los Angeles, uh, was, uh, uses phrases like order of magnitude and bloody hard. Man, you're drum rolling this so hard. I want to get a name. <laughs> Is, con is aware of the Visa credit card network and its finer details and would have a deep psychological motivation to do it at all is Elon Musk. Really? You think he might be the OG? Man. Fascinating. And what, what kind of ramifications would that have, do you believe? Or why do you think that's, uh, that's an important thing to discuss? Well, let's see what happens. And maybe that can get discussion going faster. <laughs> I mean, it would definitely be a very cool story. Elon, uh, Elon having just another huge influence on the world and uh, transforming the, the economic landscape of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I can't, I can't speak on that. I have no idea about any of the things that you're, that you're saying, but uh, you've, you've heard it here first, or maybe not here first, but you've definitely heard it here solidly. You put your, you put your prediction in for this one. And I hope it'll, uh, not I hope, I know it'll be great because finally the positive perception of Satoshi can be unified with Musk and people who are like, oh, we love Satoshi, but uh, we have this negative caricature of Elon. Like they're going to short circuit. They're going to be like, <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> my whole worldview is wrong. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Cool. I, it's interesting what you said about the the Reddit forum. I didn't know Reddit had got kind of censorious like that. Uh, I thought it was kind of like a one of the bastions of free speech. I guess uh, I guess Reddit's kind of fallen recently, huh? Kind of. I get kind of why they're doing it because. The Big Bang is kind of like, oh, it's science over the conspiracy flat earthers, which like, yeah, I get that. But no, what if the Big Bang is wrong? And then let's talk about the specifics. That's, yeah, uh, I, I, say let the, I say let the flat earthers come on and share their <laughs> knowledge about the world. <laughs> you know, what if they're right? You know, we can't, I don't think we should ever put somebody in, in a position of uh, complete power and knowledge to especially on somewhere like Reddit, like where they're not, they're not influencing public policy or anything like that. No, so I, def I definitely, I, I am vehemently against the idea of censoring fringe ideas because, and I actually, I actually spoke to a, another Gupta, uh, Dr. Sonectra Gupta on uh, a couple of episodes ago, or one episode ago, actually. And she's the, the co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration of, uh, you know, saying the lockdowns were no bueno and that they gave a, a f more of a focused uh, protection approach at the beginning of the, the pandemic. She's an Oxford epidemiologist and she, she was facing kind of similar, uh, similar issues to, to this Gupta. <laughs> and, uh, 
she was getting a, she was finding a lot of the scientific establishment attacking her and censoring her and one of the things that she said is that you know she just she was completely taken aback that people thought that scientific consensus was uh, you know something to point towards being a good thing you know something that's point towards uh, something is definitely true because there's scientific consensus and this this is what we we have to remember is that throughout history we have consensus we have near consensus and all of the movements towards innovation have come from the fringe so even if you can, even if you are a fringe that's not a it's not a diss you know you're not you're not you're not worse off for being the fringe you're the you're the person saying i'm going to question the orthodoxy i'm going to say what if you're wrong and if i'm right i'm going to disrupt this whole fucking world that you've built and these careers that you've built and people don't like that people don't like the idea that you could collapse their house of cards by just one and it, it sounds like, I mean, I'm, I'm not hundred percent convinced because again, I've, I, I'm stupid and I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm, I'm a lot more convinced than I was at the beginning of this conversation. And it sounds like as, I mean, especially if that equation is right. I mean, that's wild. That's, that's insane. That's world changing. Uh, so I, I really, I really feel that these conversations, they, they have to be had and I, I really admire your diligence and your passion to having these conversations, despite the fact that you've had such a, such a negative response from, from the kind of mainstream establishment scientific community. Thanks. I just see the expected value of this is so great. It's so great that at short term pain, you know, it's worth it. And we you throwing in another poker term for me there. No. Was that oh, it? okay. E e e yeah. is like a very, very well spoken, uh, commonly spoken. But I, I am calling the I am calling the bluff <laughs> of these big <laughs> cosmologists. <laughs> I've been bluffing for a hundred years. <laughs> that's funny. I think that's a that's a good point to end on. Is there anything else that you you feel like you wanna you wanna share with the world before we before we stop? And I'm by the way, I'm super happy to have you on again. This was so much fun for me. Cool. I'd love to come on. And I just say uh, to anybody listening, develop a really strong mental fortitude. If you have a question, like if you're doing your own research and you, you know, hit a block, oh, maybe something that Sahil brought up. Oh, is that really true? Maybe he's wrong. Like, just you know, think about it. And then if you want to ask me a question, ask a question and I'll, I'll address it because there's a lot of, there are a lot of like roadblocks. It's like, oh, I get this far. It's like, oh, no, I don't want to push past that. But no, just push past it. Ask me a question. I'm glad to help. I'll link uh, your Twitter on in the in the video description. Is there any other way that people want to reach out to you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at Sahil Five D. And I'm around <laughs> for any questions. Yeah, amazing. And uh, thank you again, brother. It was honestly, I had so much fun. Even if even if we're both delusional apes, uh, it was it was a good time. Well, if I ever say something's moving faster than the speed of light, then you can call me delusional. <laughs> 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 yeah no I, I you're obviously not a delusional person i i, yeah. I actually yeah. one of the, the one of the main reasons i i wanted to speak to you is because uh you know I, I i saw how you're writing i saw how you were speaking i was like that the guy seems very grounded in in reality so i, I was open to hearing hearing about the fringe because reality is more interesting than make-believe oh man there's a there's a quote that i love I mean, we can end on this is uh, the Terrence McKenna quote. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big Terrence McKenna fan. Yeah, I think he kind of went off the deep end, but it was something along the lines of uh, the world is more magical than even the maddest amongst us can, uh, can imagine. And I truly believe that. I mean, look at the nebula on your, on your hoodie. Nobody could have imagined that. Yeah. But you had to see it. Yeah, science is cool. All right, beautiful. Uh, Thanks, Charlie. Talk thank soon. you so much for the conversation i really hope that we can we can speak again and uh yeah let's obviously keep in contact and uh see if we can get that debate going or the circus show and uh see how we can move forward sweet see ya peace brother